So this is one of those Gospels, again, which uh, it's very important to remember the need to read the Gospels in context and not just simply from the lectionary, because some of the things that come directly to us in, today, or in today's reading come directly from what happens in the baptism of the Lord, which happens right before this. Now, it makes sense to have this reading on the first Sunday of Lent, because the first part of the reading, which is also very important, although being brief, uh, is why we have Lent, this days of preparation for Easter. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But again, remember what we have right before this gospel, and it's actually alluded to in the first line of the gospel, is our Lord's baptism and the descent of the Holy Spirit in bodily form on him, and then immediately his fasting and temptation. So we begin immediately with Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit. And again, this is a, is a reminder that this is the same, this is uh, because of our Lord's humanity. The Lord does not have the Holy Spirit descend upon him because he lacks the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit depends, descends upon him for the same reason that he's baptized. Because he doesn't need baptism either. It's because he is taking our humanity through this. He is bringing our fallen humanity to the waters of the baptism of repentance. His humanity is receiving the Holy Spirit. And he is experiencing in this reading, the temptation that comes from uh, the, uh, our human nature. So all of this is tied together. And he's there for 40 days, and then he's tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing uh, during these 40 days. Now, why 40 days? Now, this number should be very familiar to us. It's a number that implies preparation. There's also a completeness to it. Uh, and so we have here, there's a number of things involved. There's Noah in the flood. There's Moses on Mount Sinai, there's the 40 years of the Exodus, and there's a couple of other allusions as well that are tied into this number. And so our Lord is fulfilling this in himself, and he is giving us an example to follow. Now, we don't fast like he does because we're in, he's God and he's able to do this, so he put a limit on the amount of time. But the fact is that he's fasting because of the importance of fasting, and he's doing so for the number of days that he is, symbolically, because this is a preparation for his public ministry. Then we begin the temptations. St. Ambrose notes uh, that there are three special weapons which we are taught the devil is wont to arm himself with, that he may wound the soul of man. One is of the appetite, another of boasting, the third of ambition. He began, as in today's reading, with that where which he had already conquered, namely Adam. Let us then beware of the appetite, let us beware of luxury, for it is a weapon of the devil. And these three weapons that he's referring to are just simply another way of phrasing what St. John says comes to us uh, sinfully from the world. That is, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and pride in, and the pride in riches from his first epistle. And note in this that like the many temptations uh, that we experience, the devil is attacking his identity, if you are the Son of God. Now, why is he saying that? Because in the baptism, the voice of his Father from heaven is saying, this is my beloved Son. So, again, we're turning back to the baptism. And he's saying, if you are the Son of God. And this is where, again, the devil will attack us. He attacks us in our identity, who we are. I mean, obviously, he tempts us to sin, but the devil is also more subtle than that. And so he will also attack us in our identity as Christians, as sons of God. And our Lord, of course, responds, man shall not live by bread alone. Notice also, again, very rich reading, and notice the example of our Lord. He doesn't argue. One of the reasons why many people fall into sin is because they try and discuss things with Satan. You are not going to win in a discussion with Satan. He is far smarter than you are. What our Lord provides is scripture. He provides revelation. He provides what God has taught us. And that's what we have to hold on to. Because the minute you try to debate, you are going to end up agreeing with the devil. You have to hold on to what you know is true. <laughs> then we have the second temptation, which the devil uh, shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Again, St. Ambrose has an interesting observation here that this moment of time is not just simply speaking to the duration with which uh, 
the vision last, but he's also referring to the fact that the riches and glories of this life are as fleeting and that they pass away as quickly, maybe not in a single second, but they do pass away and they are fleeting. We also see in this particular passage another reality about the devil and temptation. What does he say? The devil says, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Nonsense. Titus comments, he lied in two respects, for he neither had to give, nor could he give that which he had not. He gains possession of nothing, but is an enemy reduced to fight. In other words, the devil is going to lie to you, not only about sin and its consequences, but also about other things about your life. There are many ways that the devil brings us down by teaching us to accept lies about our self-worth, about our future, about our dignity as Christians, about God's honesty, about God's grace. He is the father of lies, as our Lord calls him. And he uses lies to lead us into sin, if not directly, then indirectly. And of course, the devil uh, saying, if you will then, will worship me and shall all be yours, is absolutely ridiculous because Christ is not going to worship him. And then we have the third temptation when he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple to throw him down. St. Ambrose again comments, the next weapon he uses is that of boasting, which always causes the offender to fall down. Origen makes an interesting observation that you note in all of this that our Lord is not putting up a real fight. He's actually letting himself be tempted because he knows he's in the right. Now, that's you can follow that example very poorly if you, if you do so arrogantly, but our Lord is confident in who he is and why he is here, and so therefore is content to suffer this. And then what does the devil do? He does something very interesting. Again, Ambrose, he's got the best comments on this passage. He says, as soon then as the devil perceived his dart blunted, he who had subdued all men to his own power began to think that he had to deal with more than a man. So he's figuring out who Jesus is, might actually be something. But Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, to St. Paul, and often from the Holy and often from the Holy Scriptures weaves his mesh with the faithful. Hence it follows, and then he quotes the psalm, uh, which we also had in Zarbus Montessori. So there's two important things to note here, and they're related. One is even the devil can quote scripture. It's not enough to simply quote scripture. St. Ambrose again says, Let not the heretic entrap you, by, entrap you by bringing examples from the scriptures. The devil makes use of the testimony of the scriptures not to teach, but to deceive. Now, without judging the good intentions of anyone who teaches this, the fact is, is that there are a lot of heretics who teach what we hear in today's epistle. Today's epistle is a perfect example of exactly what we're talking about. What do we hear in today's epistle? We hear that famous phrase from Romans, which is the one that says that all you have to do is accept Jesus as your Lord, believe that he's risen from the dead, and you will be saved. And in one sense, that's actually true at face value. But it's not how it's interpreted. It's not... It's not understood in the context of the scriptures. And the reason I say that is, is that, yes, actually, if you accept Jesus as your Lord, you will be saved. Why? Because if he is your Lord, then when he says that you must be born again by water and the Spirit, as in John chapter 3, you're going to get baptized. And if he is your Lord and he says... In John chapter 6, that if you do not eat my body and drink my blood, you do not have life within you, you will participate worthily in the Holy Eucharist. If he is your Lord, then you are going to care for the sick and the imprisoned and feed the hungry, etc., etc., 
or go to hell, as he says in Matthew chapter 25, if he's your Lord. If he's your Lord and he makes Peter his vicar, Matthew 16, 18, and then a whole bunch of other scriptures about the church, then you are going to accept the church which he founded and the structure that he founded with it. So yes, in a sense, if you accept Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. But that means accepting all of it. And nowhere in any of this, in the context of scriptures, do you ever hear any idea of once saved, always saved. You can reject Jesus as Lord like that. You can say, I'm not yours anymore. So, again, context, understanding scripture the way it's intended. And this passage gives us another perfect example of this because, as Origen observes, uh, he says, uh, the devil is quoting a psalm about the angels guarding you and bearing you upright lest you dash your foot. And the very next line of that psalm says, you will, walk, you will walk upon the asp and the basilisk. The, the proper translations of the scriptures maintain you know, things like basilisk and unicorn and things like that, which us modernists don't like, so in English we, we've taken those away. But asp and basilisk. And so Origen then rhetorically is asking the devil, uh, you know, after he's quoted the psalm, he says, but why are you silent as to what follows, having quoted the psalm? You shall walk upon the ask of the basilisk, except that you are the basilisk, you are the dragon, and the lion. So the devil is taking this one line out of context for his own benefit. And the irony again is that in the very next line is a scripture that says that those who are faithful to God and trust in God will conquer Satan. So it's very, very ironic. <laughs> Our Lord again responds, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Simple, one-line response, and he's not arguing. He's just simply establishing what God has revealed and what is the truth. So, St. Cyril commenting on this says, Christ took him captive by meekness. He overcame him by humility. Do you also, when you see a man who has become a devil coming to meet you, subdue him in like manner? In other words, our way of responding to people who are being evil is these two virtues of Christ which he ascribes to himself of meekness and humility. And the last line of this gospel says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. There's a couple of different ways of translating that. But, again, St. Ambrose makes the observation on this, uh, every temptation, that every kind of temptation really is summarized in the three that we see today. He also makes a tactical observation which we need to take to heart in our spiritual combat. That is, you can see then that the devil is not obstinate on the field, is wont to give way to true virtue. Which is why St. Peter advises us in his first epistle, Be sober and watch, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, Goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Resist him strong in faith, knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world. So we have an obligation to resist, but we have an obligation to resist properly, uh, to resist as Christ did. I just want to end with a couple of comments uh, regarding temptation of spiritual combat uh, to further flesh out this point, uh, this lesson that are being taught by the scriptures. The, I read recently in St. Alphonsus Liguori's Preparation for Death uh, an account from an exorcist that said that under the, the pain of the exorcism, a devil had confessed that what the, the kind of sermon that uh, the devils hated the most was the sermon on the near occasion of sin, because it was by the near occasion of sin that Majority of people were trapped. And so I'd like to, not for the sake of poking the devil in the eye, but for the sake of being as effective as possible, preach just a moment on what must seem to be the most tactically uh, prudent topic, which is the near occasion of sin. So you use the phrase, you pray your act of contrition. I don't, I, 
think most uh, acts of contrition contain this line because they should, uh, because you're not really sorry if you don't have at least a resolution to try to avoid these. But in battle, you obviously try to avoid engaging in conflict unless it's necessary, at least you should, right? Uh, and while we have the tools and the grace uh, of God to resist temptation, you shouldn't be looking for it. Because quite frankly, we don't have a, a healthy fear of the devil. If it weren't for the grace of God, he would eat you for breakfast easily. The demons are far superior creatures. They are far more intelligent. They are very evil and therefore have some very confused ideas now, but they are far superior to us and we don't stand a chance. So we shouldn't be looking for the fight. We should be trying to avoid it as much as possible in reality. St. Ambrose of Milan, again, he warns us that the devil's snare cannot catch you unless you're already nibbling at the devil's bait, right? So near occasions of sin are what we call these. It's where we avoid things, situations which either objectively or for us particularly are going to lead us into sin. These can be who we hang out, where we hang out, buffets, bars, the internet, whatever it is, wherever we're going to be particularly inclined to sin. I'm going to give a, a simple example that's not too controversial. You can extrapolate from there. How does the devil work? Let's say that you have cookies in the kitchen, and either you really need to lose weight for health reasons, or you're diabetic, uh, or you've given them up for Lent. And in that case, you probably just shouldn't have them in the kitchen. But let's say you do because your spouse and says something. I don't know. You've got cookies in the kitchen. And you are already retired for the evening. You have no reason to be eating cookies. But then this idea occurs to you. Did I turn off the stove? Did I pull this thing out that needs to thaw for the meal tomorrow? Did I put this away? It's whatever it is, right? That is actually a temptation because the devil knows that if he says, go oh, eat cookies, you're probably going to say, no, I need to lose weight or I'm going to die because I'm diabetic or I made this resolution for Lent and I'm not going to do it. But if he says, you left the light on in the stove, you're going to go take care of that, right? And then you pass the cookie jar. And then it's all over. There's a lot of guilty laughing going on right now, okay? You know exactly what I'm talking about. This occurs in a lot of different ways, right? It's not just this. It could be whatever the uh, whatever your particular sins are. But this is what we mean by occasional sin. This is what we mean by what the devil does in his tactics. He is intelligent and he knows what he's doing. So I just want to speak about two general occasions of sin this evening uh, to conclude. And they are idleness and being alone. You might be familiar with the idea that the idle mind is the devil's playground. St. John Bosco puts it this way in the same vein. He says, the principal trap that the devil sets for young people is idleness. Take heed, parents. This is a fatal source of all evil. Do not let there be any doubt in your mind that we are born to work. And when we don't, we're out of our element and in great danger of offending God. First tell the devil to rest, and then I'll rest too. Now, this is, he is not advocating the breaking of the Sabbath. The Lord's Day is Sunday for Mass and prayer and family and rest, with some exceptions for legitimate reasons. And we need rest every day as well. We need legitimate rest. We don't need to spend hours on our damn phones or in front of a television. We don't need to be on tablets constantly. We need to be doing our duties. And we need to teach our children to do this as well. There's just so many parents who wait until their children are a lot older, and then all of a sudden they're trying to get them to do things, and the children are like, what do you mean, work? What is this work you keep talking about, you know? Doesn't doesn't happen. So in raising children, we have to make sure that we, we start young on this. Uh, 
but idleness for young and old, no matter what age you are, what state in life you're on. Uh, there's always prayer to be said, there's spiritual reading, there's scripture, uh, there are people to be visited, there are many homebound and sick who could use the visit, etc., etc. There's a lot that we can do out of mercy for people, so idleness has to be avoided. Another area which is very important is being alone. St. John Chrysostom warns us, Jesus' intention, he's speaking here going to the desert as in today's Gospel reading, was to have the devil come after him. So he gave him an opportunity to tempt him not only through his hunger, but also through the kind of place where he was. For the devil most especially assaults us when he sees us left alone all by ourselves. In this way, he also set his trap for the first woman, Eve, in the beginning. He caught her alone and found her apart from her husband. It's the same with us. When the devil sees us with others and banding together, he's not as confident in himself, and he makes no attack. For this reason, we have the greatest need to be flocking together continually so that we won't be open to the devil's attacks. Now, again, just like with idleness, there need to be times when you are alone, when you are quiet, when you are still and praying and listening to God. And that should be done regularly, but not excessively. What St. John Chrysostom is advocating here is something that's super important, that is holy community. Ideally, it should be the home, although that's not always the case. It should also be the parish, which should be the case, but is not uh, uh, taken advantage of like it should. This is one of the reasons why we have so many of these potlucks and stuff. It's not because I am wanting for food. We live in America. Getting food is not difficult. And if I ask, I can get it. I do this because we need to get together. The reason for the homeschool co-op, the reason for our potlucks, the reason for all these things, the youth group, is because we have to gather in community. You know, uh, some there are many demographics in this parish that do not get together regularly enough. And we need to establish something here at the parish where Catholics can get together and not just to focus on one area of business, but to actually live together. That's why the Society of St. Anthony of Ottawa is so great, uh, why we have a very good youth group, but many people don't come because school and sports have become an idol and they're not willing to let go of them, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is that we have to have this community. You need the reinforcement of other Catholics. You need it because it is very difficult to be a Catholic in this world. And if you are not surrounded by people who are going to support you in that, everyone else is going to lead you astray. That may not be their intention, although for some people it may be. They may not be doing it deliberately. Uh, it may not be uh, your intent for being with those people. But the fact is that if you do not spend your time with good Catholic people, you are going to be led astray. As a priest friend of mine likes to say, you can't swim among the icebergs without getting cold. Okay? Who you spend your time with will determine who you are. It's especially true of our young people, but old as well. Be careful who we spend time with. We need this community because we need to support each other in, on the road to heaven.